Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning members. Um, I apologize in advance uh, for how I pronounce the name. So, Pramari versus Sulandari? Absolutely correct. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so, each side will have 15 minutes to present their arguments, and the appellant may reserve up the five. Okay. You're, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. You're being received. Okay. I apologize. I'm just getting stuff pulled up. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, Christopher Reynolds for the appellant, and I'd like to reserve five minutes for a rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, and may it please the court. <clears throat> We're here today on uh, an appeal that, from my perspective, the underlying judgment involves uh, several errors and a lot of rather disjointed reasoning, so I'm going to try to do my best to kind of distill it down um, into some what of a meaningful uh, structure. Essentially, the way I see it, there are really two focal and related issues um, that drive all of the other issues, both ones before the trial court as well as before this court, and those are whether or not the underlying judgment entry of dissolution is either void or non-final. And we had actually... Um, filed, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, a uh, motion to determine jurisdiction, which has been consolidated with the merits uh, on that basis. Um, the reason we did that is that we believe that the underlying legal issues that inform those two related focal issues are jurisdictional in nature. trial court, as I mentioned, all of the alternative arguments flow from these two central issues, including whether or not there is, uh, it's procedurally proper to have a motion for relief from judgment, because if we don't have a final judgment or a void order, then there's no basis for the relief, um, as well as uh, our motion to convert the dissolution proceedings into a divorce action. <clears throat> these threshold jurisdictional issues essentially implicate a challenge to, at least in what my experience is, what many practitioners wrongfully believe, routinely believe, is that in dissolution proceedings, unlike divorce proceedings, that a court has no authority whatsoever to scrutinize the separation agreement that parties present to the court, um, so long as the parties, quote, agree to it. Um, whereas in divorce proceedings, I think it's relatively common knowledge that the, the, the trial court has an independent duty to determine whether or not the substantive terms of that agreement are fair and equitable. Um, I, would, uh, I would posit... So you're saying in the divorce uh, proceedings, even though they might come to an agreement as to uh, division of property, um, the court has more of a duty to, to look at that than in dissolution. Absolutely. Right. And, I, and I wouldn't actually I challenge... I'm but, sorry. But even in the solution, the parties are required to file an affidavit of assets. Not necessarily, Your Honor. It depends. It varies from court to court. Um, in a dissolution... It depends on what? It depends on the court. It varies from, court, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Medina does it require an affidavit of assets and liabilities? Medina does not for a dissolution, no. Some county does. I believe Lake County may. Cuyahoga County does not. Lorraine County may. I don't believe Geauga County does. So if, if the court has no knowledge of what the assets and liabilities are that are, that are being divided between the parties in a dissolution in a separation agreement, how does the court even know whether everything was divided? Well, that's a good question, Your Honor, and that, that was going to be my next point, which is while I, I would not argue at, at all that the court in a, sitting in a dissolution matter has the authority to second-guess the party's division, the substantive division of assets, I do believe it has an authority and a duty to scrutinize the terms of the separation agreement to ensure that categorically they've included everything. Because the revised code, 3105.62 and 63, require that a separation agreement in a dissolution proceeding must include the division of all property. So a court can look at the categorical substance of a separation agreement to make sure that real property is covered and that uh, accounts are covered and that debt is covered, and in this case, businesses are covered, or any other assets, some sort of catch-all provision that says, hey, anything else that you guys have that hasn't been specifically enumerated, here's how it's going to be divided. I don't believe the court can say, you must divide it this way, 
but I think that they have a, a duty to determine that all of the property has been captured. If not, the mandatory shall, there's two of them in 3105.63, it says the separation agreement shall be appended to the petition and it shall provide for a division of all assets. And this isn't a new concept, it's been around since at the very least the early 80s. Okay, but the parties asked to swear that you've made a full and complete disclosure of all your assets and liabilities at the hearing? Yes, Your Honor, but a disclosure is different than the separation agreement actually providing for its division. So people can have a knowledge of what exists and what doesn't exist, but there still may be a substantive error in the separation agreement that just fails to divide it. So knowledge of what the assets are is only half of the half of the issue. Knowing both parties knowing exactly what they have is different than what ultimately is adopted as a court order says, here's how that asset is going to be divided or treated. So simply because parties know what they have doesn't translate necessarily into a court order that in total divides all of their assets. So disclosure is one thing, but division is something different. And I believe that the statute calls for the division of all assets, not just not the disclosure of all assets. Yes, in order to divide everything you probably have to know about it, but one doesn't beget the other necessarily. <clears throat> so, I would suggest that the court has a duty, a jurisdictional duty, to make sure that it's properly seized to jurisdiction before it proceeds on a dissolution. This is also not a novel concept. 3105.62 is the dissolution analog to the divorce statute, which says it's the residency requirement statute. that says the court has to inquire whether or not one of the parties has been a resident of the state for six months. It's jurisdictional in nature. If one party hasn't been a resident of the state for six months, it doesn't matter what the separation agreement says. The court lacks subject matter jurisdiction to proceed. The same statutory man mandate in the following statute that says that the separation agreement has to include a division of all property, and it's different than even in the divorce statute, has to be met for the court to have proper subject matter jurisdiction to proceed in a dissolution. Didn't both parties appear at the final hearing? They did. So who are you alleging, how are you alleging they have acquired no jurisdiction? Because the separation agreement omitted a significant marital asset. So the separation agreement itself was faulty. It was statutorily incomplete. And so because the court wasn't vested with subject matter jurisdiction, and it's not the court's fault, right? I'm not blaming the trial court for having accepted a separation agreement. It happens all the time. The problem here is, and I'm not, again, casting stones even at the litigants, is that they prepared it, one of them prepared it, in our opinion, I know that the other side disagrees, um, on their own. They were pro se litigants using the court's standard forms. And they circled items. And they didn't include a significant marital asset. And because that asset was left off, this isn't the pencils and erasers that, that my opposing counsel has suggested that it is. We're talking about the value and the division of Mr. Permati's Merrill Lynch um, book of business, for lack of a better term, including back-end bonuses and um, other significant or potentially significant um, financial assets that were derivative of his employment with Merrill Lynch. These were the same type class of of assets that were dealt with in the 8th District in the case of Wojanowski, that at the time we presented it to Judge Kovac was only at the um, trial level, but has since come down from the 8th District upholding it. The 8th District has found that those very same assets that we're talking about here that were omitted from the separation agreement are marital assets, well, subject to know, division. How do we know that without um, having information as to the type of um, employment agreement uh, was in the 8th District case as opposed to the one in this case. That, that gets to another uh, question, Your Honor, that I think is very interesting, which is why this case is such a mishmash, pardon me to use the term, is that we had requested on all of our all of our claims in oral hearing to present evidence, and including on the 60D, which is a, se a separate issue, which I can get into. And the trial court refused to allow us an oral, oral argument, required us to present evidence on affidavits. We were notified about a month before the, the briefing deadline 
that we were going to have to present. We didn't have a trial date. We were just notified that we were going to have it tried on affidavits and submit evidence. And both sides had, had to do it that way. I believe had we had the opportunity to cross-examine Mr. Permati to, to develop further discovery, there were discovery issues that were outstanding and not required to try this case on paper, that those facts would have been more um, would have been fully developed. Um, the trial court on the jurisdictional issue, as it relates to um, whether or not the separation agreement contained this asset, tried to rectify or, or, or reason its way around why the judgment wasn't subject to attack for being void or non-final by doing essentially two things. Judge Kovac argued that it was in fact contained in the separation agreement by referencing section seven of this standard form and as well as taking the very... Um, Counselor, you're at five minutes. Okay. I'm sorry? You're at five minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, by taking a contradictory standpoint and saying at the same time, while it was contained in the separation agreement as an asset, it was also considered income or an income stream. Um, I don't know how to rectify those discordant positions, but that's what the, the trial court found. As it relates to her argument that it was contained in separation agreement, she refers to section seven, which deals with intangible assets. Um, the, nominally, the this, this section refers to intangible assets, but when you look beyond just the, the section heading, she's trying to argue effectively that, well, business interests are intangible assets, you can't actually point to something and say that it exists, <clears throat> that somehow it, it just backdoored itself into the separation agreement that way. Well, the problem is, is that separation agreements, as we know, are, are subject to the terms of contractual law. And we have these old contractual maxims of the one in particular is when you include a certain number or you include items of a particular class and exclude other things, you can't read the agreement as to include the things that are excluded from the class. I'm not going to try to fumble through the Latin exclusius unius, <laughs> or includius unius. Um, and section seven, by its plain terms, refers to effectively deposit and retirement accounts. It says equity accounts, bank accounts, retirement assets, think other like accounts, or other like assets. It doesn't say anything having to do with business assets. Inchoate bonuses and back-end uh, remuneration from transferring your book of business to another broker, which are the issues, the, the, the assets that are at issue here. So I don't believe that the, the trial court's reasoning in that respect um, saves the separation agreement from being statutorily problematic. Likewise, I, other than the inherent um, inconsistency, I don't know how you can treat an asset well, at least one court treating an asset, and again, I understand that they're, they're, we didn't have the opportunity to develop the record as much here, but that's treated in one district for pe uh, a, a financial uh, advisor for the same company, Merrill Lynch, in the 8th district in Wojnowski, fighting over the same issues, meaning the back-end bonuses and the value of the book of business for Merrill Lynch, being a marital asset upheld on appeal and then treating the same thing in the 9th district as being magically included in a section that doesn't seem to make sense to me, or treated as an income stream for purposes of spousal support, which admittedly there was not. Um, as such, I think that this really boils down to some of the cases that have been before, at least I know, Your Honor, um, Judge Carr and Judge Moore recently, within the last 18 months, in Wallace and Benson, it reared its head the, I think, the second or third iteration of Benson, where in a divorce context, if a divorce decree leaves out a significant marital asset, it's not final. It's just, you don't, we don't, we don't have a valid appeal. Um, the same statutory justification for that is that the divorce court has to follow the statute. The same thing applies when you're applying a dissolution. The divorce court has to apply the statute. The statute says you have to include everything. 
and it's not. So if it's not there, and it was acquired during the marriage, which Mr. Permati admitted it was, and that it had value in his admissions that were submitted to the trial court, I don't know how the trial court can find that it's express exclusion from, or patent exclusion from the separation agreement can save it. <clears throat> Further, um, and moving on to the uh, 60B issues. Um, Counsel, you only have like 30 seconds. Okay, well then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll not move on. I, I wanted to cover the jurisdictional things, uh, most importantly, so I'll, uh, I'll reserve the remainder of my time. Okay, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Okay. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Lisa Dorman, D-O-R-M-A-N, on behalf of um, the appellee, Donald Camardi. Thank you. May it please the court. We believe that the trial court did not abuse its discretion to overrule the appellant's motion to vacate the decree of dissolution. And the main reason is because there is a distinct difference between people or parties who go through a divorce and parties who go through a dissolution. And in fact, the court has two different roles in, or two different functions when they're dealing with a divorce opposed to a dissolution. For a divorce, the court is determining the, I mean, the, determining the assets, the liabilities, and allocating those to be fair and equitable. They can even have the broad discretion to insert equity if they don't find that there is an equitable division. Whereas in a dissolution, the court has a different function in that fact, where they're determining that both spouses, under oath, at the dissolution hearing, swear that they have voluntarily entered into this agreement, that they've disclosed to each other all of their assets, all of their liabilities, they had knowledge of those, and that they're satisfied with the terms. That also, that they question them under oath whether or not they find that the terms that they've agreed to voluntarily are um, to their satisfaction. And then, of course, that each spouse seeks to terminate their marriage. All of that's done under oath in front of the trial court judge who is in the position to see the credibility and to understand what the party's intent are there. And in a dissolution, it's agreed that it is a contract, but it's a voluntary contract. And in that voluntary contract, granted, it, these parties used that form that Medina County provides, but you know, the record will, sh certain records will show that during, during the dissolution hearing that both of these parties were very clear in their intent. Um, the court in the dissolution hearing cannot then insert if they, not knowing necessarily what the assets and liabilities are because they're not listed word, you know, uh, in a word for word, but they cannot examine and modify the property division. They cannot insert equity if there isn't equity there. Um, the court um, placed on its form uh, that each party agrees that all um, of the property has been um, disclosed? Correct. And then, and, and then the trial court then during the dissolution hearing under oath said to the parties, Do you, did you voluntarily enter into this agreement? Did you, see, did you understand the terms of this agreement? But, but my specific question is whether or not the trial court could or did uh, ask the question uh, as to whether all of the assets were before the court. I believe that they did because when, although the, the, the form did not list it, I believe in the transcript the trial court did ask both parties if they disclosed all of their assets and liabilities to each other. Um, there is not, I, I think that there is a part of the form where they can add like any and all of the above if you want to list certain things. But what the opponent is arguing is that this one asset wasn't listed, but there are other assets that weren't listed also um, that she found to be fair and equitable, her retirement and her investments. So, not every paper, pencil, eraser, but I mean, even if you're talking about bigger things like investments, retirements, book of business, those type of things, that was circled in that 7B, which that which is the intangible that was uh, circled, and then they were asked under oath whether or not they knew about those assets and they disclosed them to each other. And then the, both parties indicated yes under oath. 
coming to almost a meeting of the minds, which is important in a dissolution hearing opposed to a divorce hearing. And then further, um, the trial court is that one person, Judge Kovac was that one person who sees and understands and can easily, the only person who can see the credibility of the parties. The transcript is very clear on what the intent of the parties were. Um, our client had had to take a few minutes to kind of go over a few things, and the appellant interrupted and said, no, we need to continue forward. So because she's in that kind of a position, we believe that the dissolution is an agreed upon entry, that they designed this together. This wasn't their first time that they had filed this dissolution. This was the second time. It was a year apart. Um, and then we also believe that the trial court correctly interpreted the separation agreement to affect their intent. Um, and then also just to kind of pinpoint on certain assets that are, marital assets that are silent in the separation agreement, silence can also be acceptance and can be dispositive in the fact that you don't need to include every single asset or every single liability on that list. Um, and silence can be also, can further ex explain how that that is their intent as well. We also find that, that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in denying her motion to convert the dissolution into a divorce. First of all, she just wasn't. She was out of time. It was 15 months later. The statute 310565C clearly states at any time before a decree of dissolution is made that needs to be before it's converted, and it was 15 months later. But moving forward, the trial court did also not abuse its discretion in overruling the appellant's 60B motion without conducting an oral evidentiary hearing. And that is very clear because there's the oral hearing is only necessary when the appellant has asserted necessary operative facts. The trial court had ample volumes of affidavits and evidence to look through to find if there were any the appellant's operative facts rose to that level. And she just didn't demonstrate it. The demonstration through the affidavits and through the evidence was that the, these are mere allegations. There was they were just literally mere allegations that could not be supported to the level of operative facts. Therefore, if there's not a level of operative facts, then therefore, an oral hearing is not required. The trial court is in the best position to, to de determine their intent. The trial, when you're looking at, for that, you're looking at clear and convincing evidence through the volumes of affidavits and and exhibits that the trial court went through, she could still not find clear convincing evidence that she should be relieved from the, her own voluntarily or voluntary agreement that she had at the beginning. And then also the trial court did not abuse its discretion in overruling the 60B giving the uncontroverted evidence submitted. Because this is, you can argue disproportionate equity in a divorce, but this isn't disproportionate this isn't a divorce, this is dissolution. The court can't then insert equity where the parties have agreed to certain things. Um, a dissolution doesn't have to be equitable to be binding and enforceable, so long as they're not procured by fraud or duress, which was not here, because none of the, none of the allegations rose and they weren't supported by evidence to operative facts. I think the biggest question here, procedural-wise, is the difference between a, di a dissolution and a divorce. And I think that when two parties have a meeting of the minds and they put their right hand up and swear that this is what they're doing and that they have full disclosure, the certain facts, and you'll see in the record, support the fact that there was full disclosure here. There wasn't any hidden assets. There weren't any surprises. The appellant also discussed um, this case from out of the 8th District, um, and I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but Wojnowski. And the trial court also addressed that case in their judgment entry, in her judgment entry, saying, yes, the only similarity is that they both worked for Merrill Lynch. They could have had different positions. She, and in that, the court, the domestic relations court in Wojnowski, found that 
and in her judgment entry, the book of business was owned by Merrill Lynch and not owned by the individual party. So that case is very dissimilar to this case at hand because when you're looking at this case at hand, his book of business agreed that he, through the record, admitted that it does have some value, but it's certain value, and it could be a stream of income that could go to maybe a spousal support, but not to an actual asset to be divided. And then it being the property of Merrill Lynch, it's hard to determine then whose asset is that really belonging to. And the trial court did address the differences between Wojnarowski and she was knowledgeable of that fact and then still distinguished it and still decided that this was a dissolution that the parties agreed to voluntarily. They said that they disclosed all assets to each other and that they were satisfied with its terms. And then, at, you know, and then, as you can see through the trial, or the dissolution trial, or the, I'm sorry, the dissolution hearing transcript, the intent of the parties is clear. And it's our firm belief that the trial court is in the best position to understand the credibility and the intent of the parties. When she's addressing one, when she's addressing the appellant in this case, the appellee interrupts and basically interrupts to say, let's get moving and move this faster. It's clear in the record in the transcript. Um, our client requested to, um, to take a few minutes to look it over. And I mean, a, a certain direct quote was, I'm not gonna go, the judge is saying, I'm not gonna go over it with you section by section, do you need to do that? He says, not really. And then uh, the appellee interrupted and said, yes. And says, so, so are you sure I mean, you don't need to go over it? And he's like, no, not really. He was hesitant because, in his worries, is that he didn't want necessarily his marriage to end. However, her quote was, it's too late. She interrupted twice while on his director examination to get the proceeding moving faster. So the transcript to us is very clear in her intent, and it also shows the trial court her credibility. And the trial court found that she signed this agreement twice, once in 2012, and then they refiled it a year later in 2013 under her own. It was voluntarily knowing that she had full disclosure of her assets, liabilities, and those of the appellant. I would also like just to point out that this court in Abramovich said that when the separating parties have negotiated the terms for dissolution of their marriage by way of a separation agreement, deference must be given to the rights of the parties to make and keep their bargain. The key there is, is that this is their bargain. This is the, what they negotiated, the terms that they negotiated together. It doesn't have to be, just that the terms are, the terms don't have to be specifically outlined in that separation agreement. They just have to be disclosed to each other and they have to be, because this is an agreement, Deference has to be paid because this isn't something where a court decided something and I didn't agree with it. So therefore, I can then say, I don't agree with it, so I'm going to appeal it. The problem with this is that this is a completely different. The court should have greater deference to parties who show their clear intent to be, for their marriage to be dissolved, but further, that they've had the time to have disclosure of their assets and liabilities and they've divided those prop the, the property properly. And we were just asking this court to uphold the trial court's decision in the fact that they did, this was the negotiated agreement that they had in the separation agreement, and that both parties wished to have the marriage dissolved. And they both wished to do it so through the negotiated separation agreement. And they voluntarily entered into that. Thank you. I have nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, uh, we've heard disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. Disclosure doesn't confer jurisdiction. Okay, so this isn't a fairness issue, it's a legal issue. So if the, if the document upon which the judgment is based is legally defective, then the court didn't have jurisdiction. It doesn't matter what everybody knew. It would be the same thing as saying, oh, we both knew we had a house, but we left it out of the separation agreement. Nobody knows how it's supposed to be divided. It's just not there. Um, the other assets were included. They're wrapped in by reference that uh, Ms. Dorman was referring to. 
And the meaning of the minds doesn't really matter when the document itself is silent. You can't interpret a document or an agreement to um, include things that are contrary to its expressed terms. You're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement. Thank you both for your presentations to the court, and we will issue a written opinion that will be sent to both sides as well as released on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Have a good day.